Welcome to Kibbe on Liberty. Congressman, good to see you again. Always great to spend time with you. Thanks, Matt. Um, I, I think the timing on this is is, is pretty uh, pretty nice for us because you just had an exchange with the chairman of the Federal Reserve. Uh, you serve on the Financial Services Committee. Um, but let's remind people, you've been on the show before, but let's remind people that you have a particular focus on, on sound money and the potential of cryptocurrency to, to rein in the abuses of, of, of government expansion of the money supply and all that stuff. But where'd that come from? Well, I created the Sound Money Caucus in um, July of 2020. So um, obviously I was passionate about the topic before I created the caucus. But in t- July of 2020, it was obvious that the approach to COVID was uh, going to be overdone with government closures and way overdone with government spending. Uh, more money than we had in the Treasury, more money than anyone was willing to lend us, i.e. printing the money. I mean, yeah. Not literally, but it's just poof, here's some money. Uh, and the Federal Reserve's balance sheet pretty quickly grew from $4 trillion to $9 trillion. So when you do that, you're, you're going to have inflation. That's called monetary inflation. That was the original definition. Then you see asset prices go up. You know, anything measured in dollars takes more dollars. Uh, and then that ultimately that flows through to the consumer. And that's what everybody's coping with today. So I think really, you know, the, the way that money has been distorted heavily by central banks, but massive overspending by governments as well, uh, is a big part of what divides us. People look at the tax rate, for example. Well, the tax rate's just, for some people, a way to redistribute the wealth. You know, we take more from the old Robin Hood method, you know, rob from the rich and give to the poor. Um, but that's, that doesn't explain why some of this gap has grown. Uh, and there are a host of factors, but a big part of our problem is the money is broken. Yeah. And I mean, that's an important point, And we've spent a lot of time on this show um, um, dissecting and complaining and, and railing against um, the damage caused by lockdowns and, and all of the authoritarian measures over that over that period of time. But none of it could have happened if it was not for the ability of, of the government de facto to just print a lot of money we didn't have. So we, we monetized those trillions of dollars. Um, which was a huge redistribution of wealth away from people that, that have um, paper currency in their pockets. Yeah, I mean, it, un- it massively uh, hurt the purchasing power. Even some people were happy because, oh, I have these dollars. They were, you know, just airdropped into my account. Bang, here's, some, here's more cash. Yeah. Um, but the reality is once you started seeing asset price inflation, you know, the wealthy people don't hold their uh, wealth in U.S. dollars. They may measure it in dollars, but it's held in real estate or stocks or bonds or, you know, other assets. And, uh, and those assets appreciate. Uh, and so the wealthy get wealthier. And, you know, they're, they're, not, uh, they're not doing it right if they don't, right? right. That's the right. way the system works. Uh, but either side, if you don't have a lot of assets, if you're living paycheck to paycheck, uh, if you've got a pension, you don't see your, you don't see your purchasing power able to cope with that rise in assets. So in a way, it, it really has robbed you. Uh, even if you've risen, it's taken away your ability to maintain the same standard of living. Yeah, the numbers are bigger, but your shopping cart is more empty. Absolutely. Uh, Thomas Massey, your colleague, called those initial um, tiny, frankly, tiny payments um, compared to how much money the government was spending. Those initial payments to people under lockdowns were the cheese in the trap. Mm. And people people thought it was free money, um, but but now when they go to the grocery store, hopefully some of them are realizing that they they've been they've been had. Yeah, and I mean it's a sophisticated form of theft, though. I think a lot of people don't connect the dots, and that's why you know central banks and governments get away with it. And you know, is it oh, is it just in America? Why we have inflation in other parts of the world? Well, because they're doing the same thing. Yeah. Right. And uh, quantity theory of money works the same way. You you print the money. Uh, it uh, causes monetary inflation, causes asset price inflation, causes consumer price inflation. And when we're the world's reserve currency, we can get away with it a little more so than another country. But, you know, it, it does tie back to ultimately the amount of money the federal government spends uh, and, and how much debt you have. I mean, we have a debt to GDP ratio of over 120 uh, percent. 
historically that's when company or uh, countries go into distress and st- people start talking about uh, defaults. Yeah, I mean, a lot of us are surprised that it hasn't been more disruptive um, than it has been, but it it strikes me that that some form of reckoning is is always on the horizon, and, may, and maybe that's a reason why um, the Federal Reserve seems so passionate um, or um, robotically moving forward on a central bank digital currency because it's it's the ultimate um, tool in their kit to manipulate the supply of money and how, how we use it. But bef- uh, and that's that's why we're get gathering today. And you've been a, a leader um, criticizing that. Um, but let's let's explain if we can in, in the simplest terms possible. I think it's wildly complex. But the Federal Reserve System is it a government agency? Are these nominally private banks? To me, it seems like the ultimate sort of crony situation where government and and certain banks um, collude to manipulate the supply of money and credit. Is that is that overstated? No, I mean that's that's a that's a short summary. But yeah, I mean whole volumes have been written about it. But yeah, I mean in 1913, the United States decided to change our um, system of money uh, at Jekyll Island. And, uh, you know, passed a law, created the Federal Reserve Act, and basically gave this uh, collection of banks power over our financial system. Uh, So monetary policy. And they basically said, the government officials are going to stay out of this. Uh, We're just going to trust these other people. Um, And essentially, they're just central planners. I mean, so free market people normally reject central planning. um, But in... In, in money, that is literally what the central bank does. They set the price of money. They set the supply of money. And when you can control the supply and control the price, it turns out you have a lot of coercion uh, capability over the market. And you know people don't necessarily get how that theft takes place. Uh, they're busy measuring their wealth in the dollars. They don't ever think like, well, how's the even unit of measure changing uh, over time? And when you look at it, you know, a dollar has not kept pace with its purchasing power. So there's, um, I'm, I'm going to geek out on Austrian economics here for a second, but um, um, obviously uh, Ludwig von Mises and Frederick Hayek were highly critical of, of the shift from um, commodity anchored um, currency to, to fiat paper dollars. But I want to go back a little bit further because I think it's, it's fundamentally relevant to, to crypto. The, the founder of the Austrian school, a guy named Karl Menger, talked about the natural evolution of money and, and the need for people to find, find a means of exchange, but they naturally gravitated towards things that held value, like, um, like gold, like silver, like um, things that couldn't be manipulated by some outside source. And no one, no one told them to do that. It's just what naturally occurred and what what the creation of the Fed and, and fiat currency does is it, it severs that relationship, not all at once, but it severs the relationship between um, what you use to exchange for goods and services and, and what you've decided as, as the actor, as the customer, what holds value. Um, and, and in a lot of ways, I think um, the emergence of crypto was, was twofold. One, you could, you could, have some trust that that manipulation that you see from governments wasn't there, um, but you, but it was also a way to escape the radical manipulation of of government paper currency. Um, and you you've been a you've been a huge um, advocate for um, open and free cryptocurrency markets. Is that is that part of the reason why? Yeah, absolutely. So I mean, uh, you know, I don't think that you. Personally, I'm not like you have to have it backed by gold, but you do have to have some constraint, right? So uh, one of the, I think, useful sites out there in this space is a site called WTF happened in 1971.com. Mm-hmm. So uh, it, it really is a reference to um, August 15th of 1971 when Nixon broke uh, the gold standards link uh, to the U.S. dollar, right? And we essentially have commodity-backed money in a theory, we call it petrodollars because the U.S. dollar is the reserve currency. But not just oil, but all all uh, commodities globally uh, are normally settled in U.S. dollars, even outside the United States. So the standard unit of measure in commodities became the dollar. Uh, and so 
that was supposed to be the constraint. But you can see immediately uh, the, you know, the middle class started getting wrecked, uh, and it hasn't been the same since. Um, and then when you look at, uh, you know, other, I guess, constraints on, on, on government broadly, fiscal and monetary policy, you know, initially you would be constrained by taxes. So if you remember George H.W. Bush, he famously said, read my lips, no new taxes. Well, how did he, how did he end up breaking his promise? Well, he at least felt morally compelled to pay for the new spending that he wanted. He was passionate, oh, we should do these things, let's spend the money, but I have to pay for it. So he felt a moral obligation to at least have as much money coming into the Treasury as he had going out of the Treasury. Um, by, uh, you know, George W. Bush, uh, you know, Dick Cheney, uh, W's vice president, said, uh, you know, Reagan proved deficits don't matter. Well, no, he didn't. He proved you can actually take on some debt. Uh, so he did take on debt in the 80s, but uh, he at least had a way to pay for it, right? So, but then you were only constrained by the amount of money you could borrow. But by 08, 09, when the Fed started uh, doing quantitative easing, they weren't even constrained by the amount of money someone would lend you. So it's really been poof since then. Let's just grow the Fed's balance sheet. At that time, the Fed's balance sheet, all the way back to up to 08, for right at 100 years of the Federal Reserve, you had, you know, about $800 billion worth of assets on the Fed's account. And that was money coming in and out. There was a flow. It was a net positive on the Fed's balance sheet. Um, but it wasn't massive. It went to $4 trillion in 08, 09, and now it's $9 trillion. So that's how we've debased our currency. At Kibbe on Liberty, freedom is a lifestyle 24-7, something you live and breathe and wear every day. If that describes you... You need the very best Liberty swag in the market today, just like this shirt I happen to be wearing. Go to freethepeople.org slash KOL and check out our exciting merch. You too can love Liberty and look cool. So there, there's some, there was some sort of uh, um, cultural constraint on, and maybe it was a political constraint on on the ability to spend money we didn't have, which which has... has Eroded, and and by the way, it, it probably coincides with um, some of our never-ending wars and the need to finance that work. And you, I know you've been outspoken on that as well. Um, but it's also like so. So the politics shifted, and of course, politicians are are wanting to spend money they don't have, and there's only so much you can borrow. There's only so much you can tax. So you start printing or expanding the money supply. Um, but the other thing that you've been highly critical of is, is mon modern monetary theory, which says, you know what, none of it matters anyway. We can just, we can just create as much currency as we want. Um, I don't even think there's any logic to it, but it's, um, it's a perfect tool for politicians that would love to spend as much money as they want. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, when you're constrained in your resources, you have scarcity. Scarcity is what produces prioritization, right? So, uh, it, but if you have unlimited resources... Well, you never have to make policy trade-offs, right? You can do, you know, guns and butter, right? We'll take everything. Um, and, of course, no one lives that way uh, except the federal government right now. And, you know, even then, it's like you see, like, from the far left, uh, you know, Bernie Sanders' campaign, for example, saying, you know, we could just do everything. We could do, we could send this money, we could do this. And what makes that possible uh, is this idea of modern monetary theory, um, except that it's not possible. What it does produce, some people buy into it, and uh, they, they, they have faith, and they go along with it. But what happens always, uh, throughout all time, uh, they didn't have the fancy phrase modern monetary theory. They just called it debasing the money. Yeah. All right? and, and, or, uh, or stealing. Stealing, yeah. theft, yeah. Uh, you know, things like that. And, uh, and it crashes the financial system because no one trusts the money. And so you bring that together uh, and people seeing where this is going and the convergence of technology, and then you have this person or persons under the pseudonym Satoshi Nakamoto in 09 published the Bitcoin white paper. And, um, you know, I think it's truly one of the most important documents in history um, because it created, you know, what I consider like freedom money. Uh, it, it really can't be canceled um, as long as there's uh, a network a computing network in the world, um, Bitcoin will be able to be transferred. Governments have tried to ban it or have banned it in other places in, in the world, um, but yet it moves. And, uh, and so is it a store of value? Is it stable 
that's a different thing. But it is uh, clearly a store of value, and it's an efficient means of exchange um, because you know you can send money digitally, and that was always a barrier uh, through all time until uh, this system. There were people that tried earlier efforts, but this one worked. Uh, and it still works. And the fundamental concept that people don't understand, they think of it like it was a product that was launched like anything else. But it really is a different computing architecture. It establishes trust different than the kind of network people are used to. They go to work and they have a network administrator and he's like God on the network and or she is and they'll uh, you know give you credentials and somebody else different credentials and they can revoke them uh, or expand them or anything else. Um, Bitcoin uh, came up with the idea of establishing trust in a different way. Uh, so there is no central network. It is a system uh, where the ledger is public and everyone else can validate it. So I think you really have to understand the computing network to really understand why it's secure and why it uh, is accepted around the world. But it does go back to that Austrian theory on the natural emergence and evolution of, of money as a means of exchange because um, it was decided by the end user what they would trust and what they wouldn't trust and is completely decentralized and that's that's where the power comes from and and these these top-down systems whether it's your 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 ad administrator deciding whether or not you have access is relevant to the threat of a central bank digital currency um, and and i think uh, I'm just thinking about Austrians this morning. I apologize for that, but there's maybe you've seen it. In in sometime in the mid 1980s, Frederick Hayek um, was giving an interview, and he'd just written his little tract called "The Denationalization of Money," and it's it's fascinating because he could not have imagined Bitcoin. He could not have imagined cryptocurrency, but he was he was like, you know what the the everything bad that has come out of government started with the creation of a central bank and the centralization of money and the nationalization of money. Um, and we're never going to get rid of that. But if we could find a way around, um, and he's absolutely describing cryptocurrency. And I think all of the hysteria about cryptocurrency is precisely what Hayek is predicting, that it's undermining the, the monopoly power of the government to just make up money. Yeah, and the quote is great. It perfectly, I, I can't quote it uh, from memory, but I know the quote you're referencing is, like, I don't think we'll ever have a system of sound money until X. Yeah. Well, you know, whoever created Bitcoin said, I'm going to find a way to pull that off. Yeah. And I think they have, and I think, you know, well, maybe other things can do it too. But the concept wasn't just against central bank digital currencies. Uh, that's an afterthought and a reaction to uh, what created, uh, you know, blockchain, the idea of blocks and the way that they move and are secure. Um, but it really is gets at the whole point of a central bank, you know, a central authority that can decide the supply uh, and the price of money. Uh, ultimately, this was, well, there's math. You can go read it yourself. That's the system. It's not alterable. It's not, it's not cancelable. It can't be filtered. Uh, and there's an immutable ledger. And the, one of the first, you know, forks or the first fork in Bitcoin came over a dispute as to say, uh, should we make these transactions reversible or is it truly going to stay immutable? So some people wanted to go one way and some went another way. Um, Bitcoin itself stayed at, no, we're going with immutable. Uh, and other systems uh, in this have done it differently. And that's the question is, can we have like this? be, you know, one system of money. People think, well, we have to have one system of money. Um, and that's kind of where they want to go with central bank digital currencies. They see this propagation of multiple systems of money, and they, 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 that's a, a loosens the grip they've got on the whole control that they've especially perfected in the United States since the Bank Secrecy Act, yeah. uh, which is its own problem with money, coercion, and control. Frankly, if you don't spy on your customers, you don't get to operate a bank. Right. Or a credit union, any kind of money service business. Uh, and so, you know, there are a lot of people that don't trust financial institutions. They stay in the cash economy or other systems. Um, and yes, yeah, some of those people are bad people, you know, uh, but it's not honest to say, um, you know, well, if you have nothing to hide, then you have nothing to fear. Because just look in Canada, right as we were launching a bill related to this 
in, in not in our country, but in Canada, uh, Justin Trudeau wants to cancel truckers for doing what? Protesting yeah. the, the government's approach to COVID. For participating and in per- democracy. <laughs> participating in free speech. Yeah. How dare you? Yeah. And yeah. Uh, we're going to cancel you. They, they didn't, uh, they, they already used police forces in other kinds of ways. And that wasn't working. So they said, oh, it's going to look really bad if we use violence. Let's just cut off their bank accounts. Yeah. And I think, you know, around the world, people have really looked at this. And China has developed what really is the theme in central bank digital currencies. You could do uh, a centrally bank, central bank launched uh, digital currency that had the characteristics of Bitcoin that maintains permissionless payment system um, with no third party intermediary. But that's not what hundreds of countries around the world or 100 plus countries, sorry, uh, around the world are studying. They're studying the creepy surveillance state kind that China's creating, yeah. which is the central government not only does the, have control of the money, they have it in a way where they can actually see every single transaction and it can become linked to a social credit score, filterable, cancelable, and permissioned programmable money, uh, as they say. It could have an expiration date. You know, if we put more money out there, you, this money's good. It could be revoked. It really is uh, the most coercive system developed yet. And all these dystopian futures have this kind of system of money. Um, you know, the Book of Revelation does. I accept that as scripture, as do lots of people. But in every kind of dystopian future, whether it's, you know, uh, the Bible or whether it's uh, books of fiction, there are, uh, it's always depicted as evil. Yeah. So why would we be pursuing this as a country? Uh, there's not a good plan behind this. These are not the good people. Thank you for joining me today on Kibbe on Liberty and for being part of our fiercely independent audience. Every week, my organization, Free the People, partners with Blaze TV to bring you this show. My guests bring smart perspectives on everything from current events to timeless philosophical debates. If you like what you hear, go to freethepeople.org slash KOL and support Kibbe on Liberty so we can continue to produce these honest conversations with interesting people. Now, let's get back to it. Why, why on earth are we continuing to, the United States of America continues to emulate um, Xi's China when it comes to using technology for evil. And, you know, we, we and, and Justin Trudeau has openly said, like, he's, this is my hero. I'm going to be like this guy when I grow up and, and it's it's a it's about social credit, which which to me is it, it's it's an it's an evil term because it's a collectivist term where somebody other than you and your family and your friends are deciding what's what's an appropriate way for you to live, to behave, what's acceptable behavior, what's not acceptable behavior, and obviously for Canadian truckers showing up to protest the destruction of their livelihoods was not acceptable social behavior. So they shut it down, but um, it is, uh, ul- it's the ultimate tool in the Chinese social credit system is um, just um, debank people. And this is, this is what happens. Bad citizens in China don't have access to their own money. And why would we, why, why, why is the Fed playing with this idea? Well, uh, they're, not, they're, they're not good people that are pushing this. And if you look in the United States, uh, we don't yet have a central bank digital currency but we have this behavior. I mean, Operation Choke Point was launched under the Obama administration. This is where government regulators went around to banks and basically said, you're not going to bank those people, are you? And regardless of who those people are, when have the people that are going around saying, you're not going to bank those people, been the good people? You know, right. these are bad things. Yeah. And, you know, even if you agree with what's going on at the time, like, well, you know, I don't know, these people mm-hmm. we shouldn't bank. Uh if you if you're going to do that, well, eventually it's going to come around to you. Yeah, and the, that's what the we've tools seen. are um, will always be abused. And it you know we mentioned earlier that the the, the radical expansion of, of of the abuse of of the Fed and the money supply, starting with the war on terror, like all of this debanking stuff. Not all of it, but it, it really sort of turbocharged after that, because there were bad guys in the system, but now. The tables have turned and we're weaponizing it against just people. Yeah, that's the hard thing. You want the tools. You, we want to find the terrorists. Um, and, the, you know, you're going to help facilitate blowing up uh, buildings and killing innocent people. Uh, you go back to the most basic uh, principles, the pre-government, 
Uh, you, you know, I think it wasn't necessarily written down or stated at the time, but there were some humans, and uh, they kind of realized, you know, you shouldn't hurt people or take their stuff. This is wrong. But due to human nature, eventually someone's going to hurt someone or take somebody else's stuff. And so we had to create somebody would adjudicate who was right and who was wrong here and provide justice, right? We crave it and, and uh, by design. So uh, come along in the system. Uh, you create these tools to be able to catch it and to provide consequences for it. Uh, but the trouble is, is you've, it depends on an honest, on an honest judge, an even-handed uh, application here. What you see now is it's just a cr real quest for power. The people with the power are using it to cancel, and that's not just with the, the money. That's with you know yeah. speech, especially. I mean, you look the Twitter files. Our friend Thomas Massey, one of uh, his best quotes, I think, was uh, Milan Musk bought a crime scene. Yeah, uh, <laughs> and it is. It's a crime scene. Yeah. and and but for having the clear look into what's gone on at Twitter we would still be having this debate, this went on, no it didn't, this went on, no, no, we have the evidence, this is exactly what went on, and now we know um, that it was going on in other places too because we see the references and the meetings and everything else. The question is, what are we going to do about it? But the way that it's really hard to get away with, uh, uh, to get caught, is if you actually control the system of money. Once you have that kind of power, uh, you know, for Lord of the Rings fan, uh, fans, I think that's like the one ring that rules them all, right, is the money system. Uh, and that's why it's always uh, at the core of the uh, system of coercion and control in dystopian um, futures, you know, where you look at what, what could happen. And, uh, you know, as has been said many times, I don't think 1984 was meant to be an instruction manual. Yeah. So you sit on the Financial Services Committee, and you are the subcommittee chairman on digital currencies. Is that I'm a vice chair on digital assets, uh, and you know we talked about that. And uh, Chairman McHenry, I said, you know, really you should get one of the bankers to be the chair of digital assets because unless we persuade someone with a banking background to embrace this technology and create legal clarity behind it, uh, it doesn't have a legislative path. I mean, I've had bills for six years now. Uh, trying to provide legal clarity for a space that is intentionally kept from having that clarity. Uh, and you know, if you made me the chair, it's like, well, everyone already knows my position on this. And it hasn't been able to move the legislation. So um, Chairman McHenry is like, well, we're going to create a committee whose only job is to provide this legal clarity. Yeah. Uh, and, and then we're going to help grow the coalition. So French Hill uh, from Arkansas is the chair. Uh, I'm obviously very active in that committee. But I'm the chairman of housing and insurance. Okay, so um, that this, and this gets to the problem. There's there's no legislative clarity, um, and and I'm old fashioned enough to think that that Congress would be the place to determine whether or not the United States government would actually create a new central bank digital currency. Um, but there's been all sorts of, of regulatory shenanigans from the SEC and other places, um, which we've talked about on this show. Um, but you just had the chairman of the Federal Reserve testify, and and the way I read it, and I'm I'm not a sophisticated guy, but he's basically saying, yeah, we're 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 doing all these uh, pilot projects and we're doing all these experiments, but but we're not ready to move forward right now, and in a perfect world, we would get Congress's permission before we went ahead and and fundamentally trans transformed um, the the uh, United States legal tender. Um, is, is that what you heard? Yeah, that's basically what his position has been. Um, and, you know, some people say, no, you don't even need Congress's permission because they gave it to you back in 1913 when they created the Federal Reserve. You guys just do what you want. Um, but that's not what our Constitution says. The Constitution says, you know, in Article One, Congress actually has this power uh, over, over money. Uh, and, you know, why? Because, well, Congress is the body that's closest to the people. We represent the people. Uh, and we're supposed to we're supposed to vote uh, and go on record for these kinds of decisions and uh, empower or the government, not simply serve as a rein in. You guys just go do what you want, and if you get out of control, we'll rein you in. That's not our system of government. Uh, it was a, a, an enumerated set of powers. You're only allowed to do these things, uh, and that's a big part of our problem. We've strayed so far away. Uh, we no longer have a government small enough to fit within the Constitution. It's oozing out all over the place, and that's why we can't afford it. 
Uh, we could afford a government small enough to fit inside the Constitution, so we need to be working hard to get it there. And especially with the respect to money, we have to keep it inside that. And, uh, you know, the U.S. dollar as legal tender uh, is one of those core principles that, um, you know, this note is accepted for all debts, public and private. And cash is being attacked in the same way that digital assets are. Um, so they haven't overtly banned cash, um, but it's really hard to use, right? Yeah. And they, they kind of want, uh, if they can't completely ban um, digital assets, crypto, uh, for example, they ultimately want to keep it account-based, right? So that you can't be trusted. We know you could be bad, right? Is the government saying this? Um, but we can control the banks. So you can have a bank account. Uh, and when you put your money in the bank, it might still technically be yours. You have some title to it, but you don't control it actively. Uh, and the bank really s helps them spy on you. Uh, and they act as agents of the state. If you've made it this far into the show, it means I must be doing something right. Key Beyond Liberty is just one of the amazing products we created for the people. We tell emotionally compelling stories and produce educational videos for the Liberty Curious. Our award-winning documentaries personalize all things Liberty, independence, creativity, hard work, integrity, and perseverance. After the show, check out our work at freethepeople.org. And if you like what you see, donate to support what we do. That's freethepeople.org. Now back to the show. And, and they're... They're an intermediary that that is more. Um, they're going to respond to the government and not you. They've already demonstrated. Well, that. they have to, yeah. right? I mean, at some point, yeah, they have to keep the customers happy, or they don't. They don't keep customers. But when everyone in the whole market has to satisfy the same masters at the regulatory agencies, yeah, then you know, well, all the banks are doing the same things, right? They might do it with more style or you know, finesse or whatever. But they're all doing it, right? right? And and because there's a little bit of a leakage in saying we might not be able to completely control it, they're going to an even creepier system where they cut out the middleman and literally the central government would control it if they go to this central bank digital currency. And, uh, yeah, that would fundamentally alter everything about our relationship with the state um, if the state really does control all the money very directly. I mean, they ultimately control the, the currency, but the idea that they're controlling the payment system. So we're working on a bill called the Payment Privacy Act right now. And so when you look at, you know, whether it's your bank or, um, you know, credit card company, for example, uh, when you pay someone, uh, there is a lot that has to happen. They have to say, well, is this person who uh, they claim to be, do they have the money? Uh, is the person they're paying legitimate? This is who they intend to pay. Uh, and they, they, we want them to do that, right? Uh, we're willing to even pay a fee uh, for the intermediary to kind of establish that trust, right? And protect us in that way. And we get our account statement. We're like, yep, that's accurate. If it's not, we want to be able to dispute it and have it resolved. Um, but in cash, it's, uh, it's, it's more efficient. Like I gave this money to this person. I'm standing there and I literally handed it to him. The question is, can we get a digital version that does it the same way that cash does? Uh, and you get rid of the intermediary. There's a risk that comes with that. Like, whoops, what if I send it to the wrong person? Well, it's gone. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so some people will still choose that permissioned uh, third party that helps you establish trust. But I think a lot of people want to have, at least for some portion of their net worth, some means of exchange that is similar to cash, but it's digital version of it. And uh, the question is, can we protect that? And the characteristic of it has to be that it's permissionless peer-to-peer -peer payment system. And even these intermediaries, when you do use them to establish trust, they have to be able to say, look, you, you could keep your data, which is how much did uh, MasterCard pay to Walmart last year? That's fine, but you can't share my data. How much did I spend at Walmart? And certainly not, what did I buy? Uh, and that, that level of data has to be kept private. And so far, we're at a point where Republicans and Democrats want that data to stay private uh, because, you know, some Democrats fear that, well, my spending on, you know, one of my colleagues was concerned, well, if I paid for an abortion in Texas, then that would come after me. In other parts of the country, well, if I bought ammunition, their government's going to come after me. 
well, keep the privacy and the money, and hopefully we can get that principle uh, out and established in law before the central banks try to impose this Orwellian system on us. Do you find any um, uh, support from the Democratic side of the aisle on this stuff? Because there's there's a tension, like the you can't actually do big government without manipulating currency. But but I thought privacy was a thing, uh, hopefully a bipartisan thing. Well, privacy so far is pretty bipartisan, and the civil liberties are still alive on the left, but the left increasingly has become more authoritarian. And the right, historically, has been often very authoritarian, but, you know, you have right, like, you know, I am a right of center, a more libertarian person, uh, and, you know, civil liberties. So this kind of comes together. You have interesting coalitions on privacy, you know, where I'm more conservative on my voting record. Uh, you know, Pramila Jayapal or Zoe Lofgren or Sarah Jacobs are people in the House that are uh, on the left uh, with their voting record, but we still agree in the principle of privacy. And so we've worked together on that to, uh, on the Patriot Act, for example, um, three years ago, or I think three years ago today, uh, we ended the business records provision where, um, the, you know, of the Patriot Act, where they could pull anything that a business had without a subpoena or warrant. So they're not supposed to be doing that anymore. The per permission was revoked from the Patriot Act. So we're still working to either take down the Patriot Act or chip away at it uh, in this next reauthorization. Well, I'm, I'm glad. Like a, my, my sense was that that, that um, cross-partisan support for civil liberties um, had really deteriorated over the last three years with, with lockdowns and and, and and I see that very much on, on the eroding support for free speech um, despite these revelations, has all become very tribal, very partisan. So I'm glad to hear that that's still happening because that was always a very powerful coalition of of sort of the, 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 the younger Liberty Republicans, and I would lump you into that category along with Thomas Massey and civil libertarians on the left that, that still um, right, rightfully worry about, about government. You would think that the government's ability to de debank somebody for speaking up in the public square, that should be like 100% of Congress. But you would think a lot. You would think so, and you would think that the reaction to the Twitter files would be universally like, they did what? Yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, when I was younger, uh, you would think the left would be leading the charge. Um, and it's a similar thing on war, you know. You know where did the uh, anti-war left go? You know, but they all got Ukraine flags in their bios, and we can't get into the war fast enough or deep enough uh, to satisfy the lust for these endless wars. And you're like, well, what happened to our country? Yeah, yeah, it's 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 mysterious. So let, let's game this out because um, I, I love the legislative initiatives that that you're leading, um, and I I do think with a Republican majority in the House, there's there's going to be substantially more activity at least on the House side. But, you know, what happens um, if the administrative state charges forward, centralizing everything? Because I think, I think the incentives are in line and they, they don't feel any constitutional constraints on their behavior anymore. I've, I've come to realize how leaky the Constitution is, and at least in the way that we, we administrate it in Washington, D.C. But at the same time, so you have this, this push towards centralization. It's starting to look more and more like a Chinese social credit system. Um, and then you have these liberating, decentralizing forces coming through through uh, crypto and blockchain technologies. Um, how does that play out? Because I, I, I feel like the government is just going to charge forward and do these bad things. But there's going to be this, this countervailing market pressure that hopefully is accountability. Yeah, I mean, ultimately... You know, you could see a point in the future where people who uh, embrace freedom uh, are the outlaws. It, it, it literally is uh, turning the world upside down. Uh, I mean, there's woe to those who call evil good and good evil, right? Uh, so we're in times like that where you're like, wait, wait, no, no. These are not the good people. These yeah. are the bad people. A permissionless Bitcoin <laughs> wallet is the new yeah. you're, revolution. You're a dangerous person. You, yeah. you, you, you have wrong think, right? Yeah. You, you have wrong speak. Uh, and now you have wrong do because you're doing something with the money outside the system. And, yeah, I mean, if you're, if you're you know, trading, uh, you know, 
trafficking people across the border like the cartels do for money, uh, yeah, we want to find that. We want to cut it off. Um, so it, it, that's the tension. But when it's turned against its own people, I mean, historically, that causes uh, changes in government, right? It's uh, you get the government you tolerate. And at some point, people will have to say, are we going to continue to tolerate this kind of government? Hopefully, we can change it working within the system and make, uh, you know, send reinforcements <laughs> uh, into Congress. And we use the halls of Congress to do what the founders intended us to do, which is to control this government um, and to rein it in, to keep it keep it in that to that point. The Reins Act, Senator Mike Lee's one of the uh, bill, the Reins Act, one of the most important pieces of legislation that we could pass to kind of pull in the administrative state. Uh, but other than complaining about the administrative state, very little's been done to pull them in, whether it's cutting off their dollars or removing them from office. And that goes across the, the federal government. I mean, you know, you, you name the, uh, the branch, where has there really been true accountability? And I think people are right to worry that the administrative state, I mean, they feel like they didn't even have to listen to the president of the United States. Yeah. So, so the House um, is, is where spending bills originate and all of these administrative state actors are at least theoretically subject to oversight and the power of the purse with a Republican majority. Um, are you confident that, that you and your colleagues will, will hold them more accountable? Well, we're certainly having hearings about it. The question is, can we get something passed? So a lot of times when you look, spending bills originate in the House um, and we'll start doing appropriations in the House. And we'll have some good amendments that pass, and you'll feel like, oh, yeah, things are going to change. Um, but then you look over in the Senate. The Senate is doing nothing on appropriations, so they don't have a bill that is ready to adopt what we pass in the House. What happens is they let the clock expire, and then they start cooking what is called an omnibus bill, yeah. which is four or five people sitting around in a room cutting deals. You get this, you get that. It strips out all the real reform. Um, regular uh, appropriations bill have not passed and become law since 2005. So that's the question. Are we going to stick to our guns until a bill that actually provides this accountability with the spending, the fencing around the dollars, none of these funds may be used to do X, for example, uh, actually becomes law? Because you know, so much of what we've done in the House in the six years I've been here, uh, we've gotten good bills passed in the House sometimes, but they never actually get across the finish line because of this brinksmanship that the Senate's engaged in. Yeah, yeah. That it'll it'll be Christmas Eve, and and um, some of your Republican colleagues will be incredibly anxious that they're going to get blamed for um, not letting their colleagues go home or not um, you know shutting down the government. This this same game that we've played, and every year the omnibus gets worse. It gets more opaque. There's more garbage in there that nobody agreed to. Um, so we'll, we'll see what happens. I want to ask you one more question. I know you got to go. Um, last time we talked um, was immediately after the Biden administration's completely botched withdrawal of Afghan in, in Afghanistan. Um, I see that you're still speaking out on that, and you, your your point was quite simple. We we need to get our guys out, and it's it's grossly irresponsible not to do not to have done this the right way what is the status of that today just this week we finally had a hearing about it so you think like some of these things are bipartisan right um getting out of afghanistan was bipartisan why did it take all the way till now 500 some days after we left afghanistan uh, to have a hearing about how we left afghanistan i mean you don't have to have uh, served in the military to know that getting the military out first and then getting the civilians out is the wrong way to do it. First you get the civilians out, then when everyone, all of our people, no one's left behind, then you pull the military out. Uh, and they did it the other way. Uh, and frankly, uh, what we had yesterday or this week is we had a Marine Corps sergeant who was manning a post as a sniper. They had intelligence that said there was gonna be a bombing. He found the bomber, made calls to his superiors, and said, I've got the bomber. Do I have authorization to take him out? Uh, we don't know. You don't know? I mean, that's, that's, that should be like, yes. Uh, and if you can't say that, well, you put the wrong guy in the sniper tower. I mean, if I had one as a, you know, an officer, I trust my guy or he wouldn't be my guy looking there. 
And if you got them, take them out. No leader made that command decision. Company commander, battalion commander, on up the chain, no one made the decision. So this poor guy sitting there can't do the right thing. Uh, and part of it was they prosecuted guys like him for taking initiative on their own. Even when they got it right, sometimes they went after him because it violated the rules of engagement. Uh, and it was even the right decision. In that case, it would have been the right decision. Well, what happened? The bomber planted the bomb. He blew up uh, uh, you know, uh, this area, killed 13 Marines, nearly killed this guy. He lost, lost his right arm and his left leg in that explosion. And it was just gut-wrenching to watch this guy's uh, you know, testimony and see what happened. Other people on the panel, uh, civilians, most of whom had served in Afghanistan uh, at a prior point in their uh, lives, had uh, people that they felt responsible for getting out. Our government had a complete moral failure to get these people out. They were inexplicably, we had people in Nazari Sharif who were on manifest. I had dozens of blue passport holding American citizens records who were on an airfield, not Kabul where the government said it was okay, including the Taliban, the Afghan government, uh, said it was okay, but another area. Why? Because these were the people that had been helping us, the people that the Taliban would kill if they went to Kabul. So we were trying to get them out. The State Department was actively blocking it. You had these citizens who came and used their own resources, found a way to get planes in and help get people out. They get a, a, a clearance to go to a safe third country, which is what refugees do. Uh, and the State Department would literally contact the safe third country and stop the plane from leaving over and over again. So, you know, I was working Glenn, with this. Glenn Beck has told this story about his efforts on, on this show, and, and that's precisely the same story he tells. And we finally had a hearing about it. We had to get a Republican majority to even have a hearing. And to this day, whether it was because of the civilian money that had to be spent or the bad decision, uh, you know, that let people be killed because no one would make a decision on the ground. Not a single person's been held accountable. No one's been fired. No one's had any disciplinary action in any way for all these failures. And that's been the systemic problem with, uh, with so much of government, so much of the war on terror. The leaders that make the bad decisions that sit here in this city in Washington, D.C., never held to account. And shame on us if we continue to tolerate that. Uh, so I, I hope we build momentum. I, I, I pray that it's bipartisan, that we hold people to account for it. And frankly, I hope that we can pass a bill uh, my colleagues and I are working on that, that will actually pay back the people, some of whom drain their life savings, uh, to cover for the moral failure of our government. But the American people stepped up and did the right thing. So, uh, you know, I think it's inspiring in a lot of ways to say America is going to keep its moral compass. Uh, but America's government, daggone, how do we not hold them accountable for this moral failure? So... You may not want to answer this question. I'll give you an out if you don't. But my question on this specific question of, of, of the botched exit in Afghanistan, is this gross incompetence or was this purposeful chaos? Gosh, motives are always hard to, to pin down, because, but, but I can't come up with a rational explanation for why would you block a plane that already got clearance to leave and go to a safe third country from leaving? Like, why would you do that? I, I, can't, I can't understand why you would say that would be okay. Me neither. Makes no sense. No. Okay, we'll leave it there. Thank you, Congressman. Thank you. Thanks for watching. If you liked the conversation, make sure to like the video, subscribe, and also ring the bell for notifications. And if you want to know more about Free the People, go to freethepeople.org.